good to, good to be with you. Um, we, we've been journeying through the, the letter to uh, the church in Ephesus. Sometimes I say the book of Ephesians, and then I'm reminded it's technically a letter, um, but it's still a book of the Bible, so whatever you want, letter, book. Um, but we've been in Ephesians, and it's, it's, been, a, it's been a great journey, and, and Paul, the way he ends this, um, ends his letter, I love it. He, he gives us some great imagery, some imagery that if you've been in the church for any amount of time, you have probably heard this passage of scripture. If you were in children's ministry at all, you probably have worn um, what the scripture talks about at some point. Uh, so we're going to take a, a, a look at the passage that talks about putting on the armor of God. And rather than read directly all the way through it, what we'll do is we'll kind of just walk through it. And, and you might see it here that I successfully found most pieces of the armor of God. Um, but there is one piece missing. Any, can anybody tell what piece is missing up here just looking? What is that? Yeah. It, 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 the helmet of what? Salvation. Salvation. Yeah. And I, it's good because there, the words and descriptions are on there. So in case I forget, I can read it on there. So uh, that's always a, always a good thing not to get confused, get your armor confused. Um, I, I, got, I want to say this. I, I've, you know this. If you've known me for a little while, you know that I had a stage in my life where I wore Christian t-shirts. Um, <laughs> And the armor of God just brought up another memory of one of my Christian t-shirts that I had. And uh, the front of the t-shirt said, don't fight naked. And on the back, it said, put on the armor of God. And I wore that in high school. I did. Yes, I did. And I hope that everyone has erased that memory that they have of me wearing that t-shirt as well. Um, but uh, what, what I love about this passage, the, the imagery in this is, is great. So we're going we're gonna to take a look at the pieces of armor here. I, I had visions of Craig and I were going to put on, like, full night's armor. Um, that was going to get really expensive really quick, too. So um, uh, we did not dis we decided not to do that. And then I brought this in this morning. Craig was like, are you going to wear that? I'm like, do you see the size of that? Um, let me just tell you, this is the belt of truth. That's more like a crown for me, a truth. <laughs> so there's, there's no way that's getting around this waist. Um, Anyway, so we'll, 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 take, we'll take a look at this. Um, so if you remember anything, crown of truth, that is not it. Yes, belt of, belt of truth. This is the way Ephesians 6, I'm beginning with verse 10. So I think we have it up, maybe. Yep. Let me read this, because it's slight. this NIV. So, by the way, if you want to know this, the NIV keeps updating every so often. So I have the 1984 version, which there's a few different words that have been updated, which I think this is the most updated one. So that's why you see some different words when I'm reading my Bible. Which happens to be the same one in the Pew Bible. The Pew Bible is the same, too. This is a little bit different. So let's, let's look at these verses together. We'll, we'll just stay on this slide for a few minutes here, Jen. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, so take, take a look at this. I mean, this, this passage, too, in, in our day and age, sometimes it, it's hard to um, it's hard to kind of understand what some of this is saying, too, because the first century worldview is a little bit different than the 21st century worldview in a lot of different ways. But, but what I love about this passage is Paul, is Paul is dealing with the spiritual world, which a lot of times we don't talk a lot about because we have a hard time seeing it, because we can't really see it. But we can feel it, right? You, you know what I'm saying? You can, you can sense the Spirit of God. You can sense spiritual experiences. You talk to people. You can say this. I just really felt God's presence. But what do you mean? I didn't see his presence necessarily, but I felt it. And so when you're talking about Paul and Ephesians in particular, he, he's talking about this worldview too. The idea is this. The way Ephesians starts in chapter 2, there's this idea too. There's the ruler of the air. And so this, it's this idea of between earth and and between the moon in particular, this is kind of the worldview, there's this realm in between the earth and the moon, and that's where all the spiritual forces would battle. And so when you talk about the ruler of the air, the idea would be that is, that is Satan, or that is the devil. That is our understanding. Um, and so for Paul, he's understanding this idea saying, hey, these battles are taking place, and the powers that are at work in this realm affect what happens even on the earth. And there are powers in the spiritual realm that affect us sometimes, even if we're not aware of it. And I mentioned at the very beginning of the series, too, it's, it's this idea, too, of there are powers at work in our world that affect us, 
even when we don't realize it. For example, maybe we do recognize this, we're fully aware, usually, that consumerism is a power that is at work in our lives. And in fact, in many ways, controls us more than we care to admit. And when consumerism gets into the hearts of people, greed gets into the heart of people. And your mode of operation becomes get, get more, accumulate more, get more, hoard more. And then they make shows about you, right? You do all of these things and just to say, yes, get more, get more, I need to protect myself, I need to get more, I need to stockpile all of these things because I live with an attitude of scarcity rather than the God of abundance who will provide my needs. So it's really fear-based. So there are, there are powers of consumerism that are in work in our lives, whole, whole, whole lots of different powers that, that lull us, that sway us, all these kind of things. Paul is talking then about really when it comes to the rule of the air, the sa Satan, the devil, however you want to talk about it, this is part of Paul's worldview. And what you see in Scripture too, it, it gets to us when we say, who is the enemy that is trying to attack us? Who is the enemy of God? And for Paul, he's going to say, Yes, it's all rooted in who Satan is, who the devil is. Now, I'm not prepared to do a sermon on the devil. At some point, at some point, I feel like I need to spend a couple of sessions maybe just to talk about our understanding of the devil. Because most of us here have been more influenced by poetry and literature through the ages in our understanding of Satan and the devil than we have been by scripture. So in our minds, if I were to ask you this question, so we'll, let's do some participation. What does the devil look like? What's your answer? Angel of light. An angel of light. Okay, all right. He looks like an angel of light. What does an angel of light look like? I don't know. Something with wings. There's a light behind it. You, you know, yes, we get, but, 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 you, but you get what I'm saying. See, even asking that question, we're just like, I don't even know how to answer that question. Well, he's red with a pitchfork. <laughs> with a tail. And he's on my right side, and then the angel's on my left side. Who is the devil? Where is he? Let me, let me just say this too. The devil, we, the devil is not omnipresent. The devil is not omnipresent like God. The devil is not everywhere. And, and let me, so let me just say this too. We give the devil a whole lot more credit than he deserves. We give the devil a whole lot more credit than we deserve. And so this idea for Paul is to say, yes, why do we put on this full armor? So that we can take our stand against the schemes of the devil. And the devil does have schemes. And however we understand the devil and the forces of Satan and the forces of darkness, no matter how we describe it, Paul's understanding, the biblical understanding is this. There are evil forces that are at work that we cannot see. And they are anti-God. They are anti-Christ. And sometimes the spirit of anti-Christ even shows up in our own hearts. So rather than us getting preoccupied with one passage of Scripture in Thessalonians to say, we're waiting for the Antichrist one day, let me just tell you, the spirit of the Antichrist is alive and well right now. And sometimes it's right here and right here. And the way that we think and the way that we treat people and the way that we operate in the world. The spirit of Antichrist sneaks right in and we start saying things as if we are dedicated followers of Christ, and the reality is, we are so anti-Christ in the way that we think. Let's put on the full armor of God. Because the devil's sneaky. He disguises himself like an angel of light. And he shows up in churches. Ooh, he's sneaky, right? He's sneaky. Now, now let me tell you this. How many of you have read Frank Freddy novels? Any of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, sum up here. Okay. I'll be very brief, so it's four of, four of us. Um, say Frank Freddy wrote these novels. Anyway, it's all about spiritual warfare, and it's lots of angels and demons in these novels. Anyway, I tell you what, when I read these in high school, I was paranoid that there were, like, demons in the bushes, and there were, there were demons under my bed, and there were demons in the trash can ready to sneak out and get me every time I threw trash. I was like, I'm trying to do something good. And the devil's right there trying to get my hand, you know? And anyway, I got really paranoid for a while, and I lived in fear. And let me just tell you, if Paul tells us anything in Ephesians, you and I do not need to be afraid of the devil. Right. Amen. Yeah. However you understand the devil. You do not need to operate out of fear. Because guess what? Christ has already won the victory. This right here tells you that. 
The powers of Satan and the power of sin has been defeated and was defeated on the cross. Now what we are to do is we put on the full armor of God. This is the idea. Why do we put on the full armor of God? To take the stand and to maintain and sustain the stand in the victory that has already been won in Christ. Because there are still some last ditch efforts that Satan and the forces of evil will do their best to try to take us down before it's all over. All right? So even though the battle has already been won, the victory has been won, there is still a little bit of war left in Satan that he tried to take us down before it's all said and done before Christ returns. This is, so this is kind of the worldview. So, put on the full armor of God. So this is kind of the worldview. Verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. So the armor of God is to keep you standing. And to maintain the ground and to say, the victory's been won. And we're going to just take our stand here. And we're going to live in the reality of Christ has already won. But guess what? I still have to put armor on. Because I can still get hurt. And the devil's schemes are still at work before Christ returns. And so this is the imagery. So we, so we, get, we get to the armor here. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. It is not the crown. Anybody want to put this on? You know, I was going to give this out to yeah, whoever can fit this. If it's going to fit around your waist, it is yours. Um, it's definitely not mine. The belt of truth. So some of the imagery. You put the belt of truth on, what you know is this. Satan, his schemes, the forces of evil, very deceptive. The whole nature of sin. You'll read in the book of Hebrews. It'll say the nature of sin is self. It's very self-deceiving. So that you and I are full off into a life of sin, and we don't even realize it. That the idea is that, yes, clothe yourself with the belt of truth. Put the belt of truth on. This is what Christ is about. This is how we overcome and take a stand. We refute whatever Satan has to say, and you refute him with the very truth. The truth of the word. We'll get to the word specifically in just a moment. So, verse 14. Put on the belt of truth. Then with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Okay, I can't even tell the difference between the breastplate and the shield. But uh, here it is. That leaves... A lot of things very vulnerable on my body right now. Uh, so let's uh, get on a large, uh, uh, yes, breastplate of righteousness. Um, and, I, and I think with this, when you talk about the word righteousness, part of this too is simply, you can define it a couple different ways. You can say righteousness is, it's a way to say that God is all about doing right things. He calls us to do what is right. A better, deeper understanding probably, not better, but a deeper understanding is Righteousness, whenever you see this in Scripture, righteousness is about right relationships with God and with other people. So when you talk about doing what is right, it is about being right, rightly related to God and rightly related to one another. Let me say it this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, Matthew 5 will say, even love your enemies. You want to be rightly related to your enemies? Here's the call of Christ. Love them. It's not an easy call. But get, let, me, let me just tell you. Satan will do whatever he can to generate as much hate in you as possible for the enemy. And who's the enemy? Oh, well, it's all those illegals, perhaps, right? Or Muslims, or anybody else that has another label other than me. And then what Satan does is, hey... You're a follower of Christ. I can get hate to happen in your heart towards another human being who's been created in the God's image too. And then we find ourselves cursing other human beings who have been created in the image, the same image that we were created in. And James will tell us, how can it be that both blessing and curse come out of the same mouth? you got to tame the tongue because it's full of poison. And Satan, say, he didn't have to do anything with this. We, we pretty much, we do this ourselves. And James will say the same thing too. Hey, sometimes the devil just leaves us alone because he's like, you guys are, you're going to you take yourself down. This is like easy. You're easy prey. I don't even have to mess with you. Take control of your tongue and start on Facebook. Take hey, control of the fingers that type the words that you type. This tongue is full of poison. And we find sometimes cursing and blessing comes out at the same time. So, breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. What does it, it go here, here to next? Stand firm then with the belt of truth. Put the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Now, they did have, I love that these are like shin guards. Um, so, 
in case you're going to play soccer with the devil, uh, be prepared, right? But, but this, these are for the feet, and the, this all is part of the, the feet. The idea is this gospel of peace. So the idea is this. Part of the way we take our stand against all the powers of darkness is to be prepared with the good news of the message of peace. And this goes back, this is, this is completely related to this too. What does Jesus call? Blessed are the peacemakers. Part of the fruit of the Spirit is to be about peace. The gospel message is you can be at peace with God and you can be at peace with one another. And we are people who work in this world for the sake of peace. So fit, fit it on. Get the, get the shoes ready and get moving out in the world with the message of you can be at peace with God. And you can be so through the person of Jesus Christ. All right? So we've got the shoes on, we've got the shin guards on, whatever you want to use. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Verse 16. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. All right? Here's our shield of faith. This is pretty nice. Um, and, and, I, and I like the imagery here. The imagery is this. Um... I look, at the, I look at the flaming arrows, too. You can, you can interpret these in a whole lot of different ways. But if you and I, practically speaking, how does, how does the devil try to attack us? How does the evil try to attack us? I look at the arrows as, I mean, that, that's, those are temptations that come our way. You can interpret it probably a few different ways. But the idea is this. My faith and my trust in Jesus Christ. The deeper my faith and trust goes, the easier it is to resist the temptation. The deeper my faith goes... And this is that you see the disciples. Jesus, help us in our unbelief. We believe, but we still doubt. We still struggle to believe. We still struggle to have faith. We still struggle to take our stand, take us deeper in our faith. And this is what I love. You look at the disciples in the Gospels, something changes in the book of Acts. It's when the Holy Spirit comes. And then all of a sudden, you've got disciples who are absolutely on fire. And they're not on the defensive anymore. They're really more on the offensive. Saying, we can't help but speak about the things that we've seen God do. We can't help it. Put on the shield of faith. As in verse 16. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Here's, here's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let me just tell you, that could do a whole lot more damage than this can. Alright? Especially this Bible. So, um, if you're going to get in a fight, feel free to come to church anytime. Take that one with you. And you can do some damage there, right? Okay, just I'm just kidding. Please don't do that. Um, there is no home of salvation. I looked in the, the, the box downstairs in the kids, the children's area. I'm like, there's got to be some armor of God somewhere. Every piece was here, except for the helmet of salvation. So, I had to improv impro improvise. And since we're in the South, this, this is the helmet of salvation for you. Now, I realized when I put this on, too, you guys are going to forget this sermon. You're going to say, he's so cheesy, and he put on a hat, a cowboy hat, the homeless. Anyway, um, that's it. We're in the South. Let's put that right up there. We're in the South. What I love is this. The, the way it is, it, these, are the, these are the armor. This is the armor of God. The idea is, with both the sword and with the helmet of salvation, Paul is kind of relating a tie in this. The idea of helmet of salvation and the sword being related to the Word of God. And, and if I know I'm joking here with this, but if you, if I can tell you anything, I, maybe I'm a little biased that this is the most important armor that you can put on. Paul might even articulate the next thing is more important, which is prayer. And if you read the passage too, you'll look up there and it says in verse 18, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. If, if I can say anything to you though, if you and I, as, as followers of Christ, um, if, if we really want to be who Christ has called us to be, if we want to take our stand, if we're going to be solid in our faith, if our faith is going to go deeper, I, there's no other way I can say it. You've got to spend time in this. And, and every church I've served at, the, the, the common response I get is like, well, how are you spending time in the Word? Ah, man, it's just sometimes. And then I ask myself, well, you shouldn't be surprised when you live a life of defeat and you live a life of constant struggle and you feel overcome when this isn't really part of your life. Satan or yourself will eat you up. 
This right here, salvation is found in here. This is where abundance is coming through too. And it's not just scripture. It's not only about scripture. Yes, prayer is intimately related to this as well. But if there's anything I can say, this becomes the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This becomes both the defensive and offensive in a sense to say, whatever the devil's schemes are, you take, you take a cues from Jesus when he's tempted by Satan in the wilderness. What is his weapon? Scripture is the word of God. What's Satan's weapon? The same thing. So you better know it. Because he'll eat your lunch with it. Come to the armor of God. Stand firm. The victory's already been won. And I think for us as the church too, this call, I think for the, I think for the church in America, especially for all of us, we, we live in so much defeat and forget the victory's already been won. We live in fear when death has already been defeated. And we live our Christian lives way too often limited around wondering, why is it so tough all the time? I'm not saying a Christian life is easy. There is suffering and there are tough parts of the Christian law. But even in the midst of the struggle and suffering, you and I can be victorious in and through Christ Jesus. The way it ends, go ahead, Jill, let's go to the last couple of slides. The way the passage ends, verse 19, pray also for me, that whenever I speak words, whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Take a kiss. The, elder, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord will tell you everything, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and sisters, and love with faith in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. As, I, as we wrap up and we close with prayer in just a moment, I, I think this: if if you if you just hear this, the first message you got from this this whole letter to the Church of Ephesus. Um, Paul, his whole sweep, the whole sweep of his letter, his, the whole tenor of his letter is this. We've been chosen from the foundations of the world to be, a, to be a people who are just like him. To be a light in the world just as Christ is the light of the world. He calls the church to be the light. And what you and I need is this. We need a whole lot of grace, a whole lot of help. And the way that God has structured the body of Christ is this. Not only do we need to put on the full armor, and what I love about this the way the language is, this isn't just put on cool armor. It, this is the armor God wears. And what God says to all of us is, here's my armor. It works. Take it on. I give you my armor. You will take your stand and it will be with confidence that you take your stand against the schemes of the devil. But the whole flow of the scripture is, we are the church. Yes, there is a battle that's happening that it, not against flesh and blood. So, so in some sense, remember who your enemy is. To a large degree, if you take anything from the sermon, is this. Let's hear this. Another human being is not your enemy. Another human being is not really the enemy. That's hard, that's hard to soak in. I, I'm saying that right now, and I'm thinking about a whole lot of faces they're going through, thinking, no, 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 they are the enemy. Our, our, our war is not against flesh and blood. It's against the powers and the spiritual forces of darkness. Can those be at work in other human beings? Yes. But other human beings are not the enemy. And can I say this too? There is no human being who's too far gone. That's hard to say. No human being is too far gone. But the grace of God is not greater than their sin and their rebellion and their brokenness. Right? And that's why all of us have hope. That we can gather together and say, we are all beggars who are in need of the mercy of Jesus Christ. And we've got the good news. That we can now go out and take the world. And we need whatever we need. We need, it. We need each other to build each other up. We need the armor of God. We need all the things that God gives to us that are at our disposal. To be who he's called us to be. But we can be that in and through Christ Jesus. Look at the cross. Dwell on the cross. Take that with and say, the victory's already been won. 
We're just learning how to live in it. We're learning how to take the stand as we take on and put on.